Brooks? Yes. Welcome to In Our Community. I'm, I'm Bill Bascom. I'm fortunate to be here today with Helen Vanderberg. Helen is the author of an English cozy mystery entitled The Domino Deaths. Helen's going to tell us what inspired her to write this English cozy mystery. Helen, could you initially tell us what motivated you to write an English cozy mystery? English because I grew up in England and my grandfather looked after me and I found a certain book on the bottom shelf of his bookshelf. I love the, I, I love the tactile sense of pulling out the book and rippling through it and the book's name was 40 years at Scotland Yard and there's my grandfather in the book. Real people are in the book. This was a complete surprise to me. <laughs> so I found out later that he had done autopsies for Scotland Yard. And the very first ones he did were the Jack the Ripper autopsies, some of them. So this fascinated me because of Jack the Ripper. I think most people know about it's also called the Whitechapel Murders. 1888, London's East End, slums basically. Women murdered one after another. And it occurred to me, how is it? How, did, how would it be for a young man to be, see that kind of stuff when he's first starting out? And the man that I knew took care of me in a very pristine environment. It was Pangbrown Thames, which, I mean, it's, it's a fictional place. And what I wanted to capture was the dichotomy of him coming from London. And over the years, he lands up in this very quiet and gentle place, taking care of his granddaughter. And the thing that pleased me so much about Pangbrown Thames is there are certain rituals like the village fete and so forth that were still there. So that location was your inspiration for the setting of the book? Were, were there other real life things that were inspired you to be within the book? I think that more that my grandfather was there and the circumstances. What has always inspired me about fact versus fiction is that people seem to think that fact is real. It's not necessarily real. It's filtered through the imagination of everybody. Now one thing I've noticed, I, I was a technical writer. Everybody in Silicon Valley knows me as a technical writer. What am I doing writing a murder mystery? I haven't murdered anybody. I don't know how it's done. <laughs> so the interesting thing for me is the leap between fact and fiction. And why some people won't read fiction, and engineers in particular. And the reason for that I encourage reading of all kinds is I think it enhances the imagination, creativity. The process for me in writing a book and having a f the physical presence of the book, it's a lifetime ambition for me. There was my grandfather in, in this book in 40 years at Scotland Yard that made me realize who he was. Then when I was going around the world, I came back to England, discovered that everything had changed. The whole civilization practically had gone. So the world inside my head was something quite fragile and needed setting down, being treasured. And the boy I went to school with cottoned on to the idea of my grandfather doing the autopsies on in Jack the Ripper, contacted another a writer in England and wrote a fact-based book, which they finally made into a TV documentary. It was a big hit. So I thought, okay, 
my experience is something different. It needs to be put down, written. It gave me great pleasure to write this book. That's interesting that your background is a technical writer. How did that influence your ability to, to write fiction? Ah, there are two ways to write fiction. You can either do it top of your head, they call it pantsing, seat of the pants. The other is by carefully organizing things. Well, in a murder mystery, you absolutely have to organize things. If you're a technical writer, Boy, you have to organize things. Technical writing involves getting information from all these different engineers and putting it in a comprehensible form. That's what murder mystery is. Any technical writer can do it. <laughs> That's interesting. Did your grandfather leave behind any tidbits of information that you worked into the book that it helped you write it? That was the other thing. When my mother found that I was going to be a writer, she gave me this little black notebook. He, my grandfather used to take these little black notebooks with him when he went on a case. She donated the last one to me, and that was the first book that I started writing my scribbly little notes in, it was my grandfather's notebook. And it fit in his vest pocket. And did that have details behind the, the crimes that he I have investigate? seen the one that he, he did, and of course, my brother has it, and he lost it, so <laughs> that's it. That's what brothers do, they lose things. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. How, how did you end up moving from England to America when you, when you were younger? I was such a plague to my mother. <laughs> she got my father to send me a ticket, so over I came. <laughs> And I ended up in California because that's where he lived. What did you, did you have any jobs other than being a technical writer? Oh, yes. I mean, I tried everything, but mostly I started out as a graphic designer, which is one of the things that pleases me so much about having a solid physical book, that it's a demonstration of all different kinds of skills, the book design, the type design, the cover design, the printing, you know, this is a pleasure. And I have written other books. I wrote um, Dallas in a Nutshell, which was based essentially on a newspaper column that I wrote in upstate New York. Way to go skydiving, way to go rock hunting, things like that. It was a, it was a good success used by Texas Instruments, Rockwell International, big firms who were moving New York executives down to Dallas who thought the Dallas was back and beyond, you know, they didn't want to come down, they didn't want to bring their wives. And the book itself spawned off a whole bunch of other little th side things, like a map and so forth. And I discovered, yeah, I can write a book, I can write several books. I also wrote a book for women starting their own businesses, which contained a business plan that was ran to 30,000 copies. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah. Did your, your background writing nonfiction help you to organize the book, organize yeah. the story? Absolutely, uh, because you've got to know, you know, what did the villain do? What time of day was it? Where's the clues? What clues did he leave behind? It's very much like writing a technical manual. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you do a lot of reading yourself? Five books a day. You, you read five books a day? Yeah, well, I <laughs> rotate through it. Oh, really? I use them as a it's sort of a remedy. If I fall ill, it, either it's a five-book illness or an eight-book illness. Depends how ill I am. It makes me well takes me out of whatever it was that was bothering me. Yeah, oh, that's great. What, what type of books do you typically read? Do you? Oh, thrillers and murder mysteries and all kinds, literary novels. I'll read anything. <laughs> has, has your book been featured anywhere? Is it? That's one thing. It was featured down in um, 
Writers' Digest conference in Los Angeles in 2013. Mm -hmm. There was a screenwriters conference at the same time. I was kind of hoping somebody would pick it up. <laughs> they didn't, but you know, we hope. Well, maybe someday it still will. Someday, yeah. <laughs> so tell me a little bit more about the schoolmate who, who collected the facts. What, was he a big part of the, the success of this book? No, he was a researcher. And when he heard my story, he it, talked to this fellow, Andrew Cook, and said, you know, I've got an idea for a book, and here's what it is. He went and did all the research, and they put this book together called Jack the Ripper. And it reflects my, my grandfather's attitude towards the Jack the Ripper cases was, it wasn't just one. He, he believed there were only three cases that were true serial killers. So I'm not perfectly familiar with the Jack the Ripper case. 1888. Look and, it up. <laughs> and was it ever solved? Or was it an unsolved mystery? So far as the general public goes, it's unsolved. Case closed. Yeah, really, it's unsolved. But, yeah, Patricia Cornwell wrote one on Jack the Ripper, too. I think hers was called Jack the Ripper Case Closed. Well, it's not. It, you said your grandfather thought there were three separate cases? Well, no, there were three that were done by a serial murder, oh. murderer. Oh. And the others were all journalist-inspired. Oh. You ought to read Andrew Cook's book because it's very good. Oh, the Mine's very good too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about... Um, other influences uh, uh, on your writing style. What was your, say, your first job when you, you came to the U.S.? And what kind of education did you get when, when you were younger? Well, I came to the U.S. when it, people just went to work. So the first thing I did was work for Taylor Publishing Company. Everybody who ever went to a high school in America knows Taylor Publishing. It's those yearbooks with all the seniors lined up. And my first job was to airbrush out of the photograph those guys who did not graduate. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I started as a photo retoucher and went through all the, all the sessions to become a fully-fledged graphic designer. And then I went I, I was living in Europe at the time, and I came back to America through New York and applied for a job at an upstate New York newspaper. I said, have you got any jobs for graphic designers? No, but if you want to write a column. <laughs> so I assisted the women's editor in writing a column, and the column was the one that started me on um, Dallas in a nutshell that held you know great following and started me realizing hey anybody can write a book <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good well how about one last thought on y the suggestion of technical writers or fiction writers r or nonfiction writers reading fiction how does that expand the thought process it's terribly important to read fiction you've got this world inside your head and you're the director, you're the cameraman, you're the actor. It expands your imagination. It nourishes your brain. <laughs> Read more fiction. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. Very good. It's been a pleasure <laughs> being with you today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining <laughs> us at in our community. Thank you very much, yes. Helen Vanderberg. <laughs> Thank you. A pleasure to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it went well. Yes, uh, yeah, quite good. all right. <laughs>